Hello, and welcome to Palisade Corporation's webcast, Simulating the U.S. Economy, Where Will We Be in 100 Years? Presented by William Strauss, President of Future Metrics. My name is Jameson Romeo Hall, and I will be your host today, and I'll be available to help answer WebEx technical questions by chat. If you experience technical difficulties joining this WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229 3239. At this time, all attendees are in a listen-only mode. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience today. The attendee list is suppressed to maintain attendee privacy. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation today by clicking on the question mark icon located on the floating toolbar in the bottom right side of your screen. I would also encourage you to visit our website and sign up for a free trial download of our software, including At Risk and the Decision Tool Suite. We invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy today's presentation. And in a moment, Bill, you have control. Okay. There we go. I I think uh, everybody should be able to see the uh, first slide. Is that, uh, Jameson, does it show up okay for you? I think so. I got, ah, there we go. Looks good. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, good Good morning, everybody. And uh, I hope that uh, the next uh, 45 minutes or so are interesting. Um, the uh, I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're going to do. Uh, and. If you can listen and read at the same time, I encourage you to read a couple of quotes. They're rather wordy. Uh, and I'll be quiet for 15 or 20 seconds after the overview, and you can catch up on those. It's hard to read and listen at the same time. Uh, but essentially, what I'm going to do today is very different than most of these uh, webinars from Palisade. That is, it's not sector specific. Uh, it's not an application of uh, Palisade's products to uh, analyzing risk in a particular application. It's grand overarching macroeconomic theory. Uh, we are going to look at um, big picture stuff, gross domestic product, and some other uh, macro variables, and talk about uh, the U.S. economy, how it's, uh, how it's been uh, sort of generated over the past 100 years or so, and in particular interest, where we're going to go uh, going forward. Uh, it's a pretty uh, complex simulation that I've built. And you'll see a few snippets of some of the uh, stuff that's under the hood. But primarily, we're going to look at some of the output and uh, some of the results. Uh, the first part, though, of the conversation, before we get to the simulation, we're going to actually kind of look at history. And we're going to uh, um, uh, sort of talk about what economic theory uh, says about economic growth. and. I'm going to show you there are some serious fallacies at the very foundations of mainstream economic growth theory. So I'll be quiet for 10 seconds and uh, 20 seconds, and you can read those two quotes. I think they're kind of interesting, and they are uh, in some ways relevant to the conversation we're about to have. So we are going to talk about um, potential discontinuities and irreversibility. We are also going to talk about some of the problems of creating models that have convenient mathematical uh, constructions but do not necessarily reflect reality. Reality is nonlinear, uh, and oftentimes in order to solve a mathematical set of a set of mathematical equations, you need to make some assumptions, and those assumptions are, in my mind, the foundations of some of the flaws. So we're going to talk about uh, capitalism's insustainability. Just a couple of definitions. Uh, capitalism's an economic system, and you'll notice the bold says, is proportionate to the accumulation and reinvestment of profits gained in the free market. As we're going to see, that continuous accumulation leads to exponential growth expectations. And the second one, I think, is a bit humorous, inside job. Uh, trusted person, well, I'm an economist, and I'm about to uh, trash some economic theory from the inside. And essentially, 
most discussions of problems with growth going forward are limits to growth uh, sort of uh, discussions. Those are essentially resource problems or ecological issues, uh, energy constraints, pollution problems. Uh, my work uh, completely abstracts away from any constraints on resources or waste. It's entirely economic theory. So uh, where we're going to go eventually is we're going to talk about <laughs> what happens if we don't have continuous growth. And just imagine for a second a zero growth world. Uh, you know, right now uh, we've had some zero growth, we've had a little negative growth, and everybody, it's not good. We all know that it's not good. Well, imagine 100 years of no growth, or in fact, conditions in the future where there's no growth possible ever again. Uh, well, we'll see that this may be where we have to go. Okay? Uh, I've already given you a bit of an overview. Uh, so uh, I just want to reiterate that this is something that is really hard to grab onto. We are all, all so um, Im embedded in sort of the basic expectations of our economic growth that, in fact, we don't even see these things. We don't even understand these things. We just take it for granted that, you know, 3 or 4% growth per year is going to happen forever. And most of you know when you have an exponential a growth relationship like that, the curve gets steep fast and starts to really go up, and that is a problem. Okay. Oh, the inside job part um, is just a reiteration of what I said also. Uh, it's totally within the boundaries of modern economic growth theory. It's not ecological. Uh, there's not a geographical constraint. Uh, there's an assumption of unlimited energy resources and unlimited uh, waste, uh, uh, pro uh, the issue of waste from, from uh, the consumption of energy is completely abstracted out of this model. Uh, it's just economic growth. So the other thing I'd like to sort of point out before we dive in is the idea of economic dis uh, dynamic discontinuity. Um, most Many academics, uh, people particularly that study complex systems, uh, understand what that means. But uh, the idea of small changes leading to uh, small inputs leading to large changes, some of them irreversible, is not easily grasped by normal linear thinkers, by regular folks. And in fact, uh, that is something that needs to be uh, sort of put out there and people have to be educated. So essentially, this, this sort of assumption of, uh, you know, we can just, as we do little things, uh, we have incremental changes and nothing else uh, leads to all kinds of fallacies in our expectations for predictability, reversibility, and endless growth. Another thing I'd like to point out, and this is uh, interesting, I think, and it's sort of a, uh, the idea here is um, that we have kind of an addiction. It's a growth addiction, if you will, uh, and anybody that's uh, studied addiction knows that uh, one of the undisputed facts is that it's a, a source of perceptual distortion. And my thesis is, in part, that our growth imperative uh, provides us with a sort of basic denial uh, that allows us to delink our action and consequences. That is, we move forward with this assumption of endless growth. And the consequences of thinking about where that's going to take us are so scary. And of course, the growth is so necessary for, for our system of economic, uh, for our economic system, uh, that we just don't make that next step in the logic sense, uh, in, in the logic to understand those consequences. Okay. Uh, and here's a little bit of poetic words saying that uh, growth is sort of a fission-like chain reaction, that is to say, uh, it's exponential. Oops, sorry about that, that's my other line ringing, I'll just let it go. Um, and uh, depending on one's perspective, uh, the byproducts are desirable, which is good if you're uh, depending on that growth, or toxic. And I'm actually going to show how we're going to have a real problem. So here's a few pictures. Uh, this is uh, these charts are actually showing um, the uh, income per capita going back. Uh, the, the front chart 
starts at 1800. The bottom chart goes back to 1200. These are based on some pretty nice data sets created by a couple of economists. Uh, and you can see, well, uh, in the, particularly in the background uh, chart that goes back to 1200, uh, income per person was what, in what was called a Malthusian trap for many years. It didn't go up or down. Essentially, if um, things got good, everybody uh, had more babies, the babies ate all the food, and population declined. There was a self-stabilizing system until the Industrial Revolution. And when the Industrial Revolution took hold, uh, there's a huge growth spurt. And you can see uh, that change in those charts. There's the beginning of the exponential growth expectation that we now have. Uh, but uh, things, two things create economic growth. One is population growth, and the other is productivity improvement. Eventually, population will stabilize. Eventually. I don't know when. It's already happening in some places, in Europe and Japan. Uh, this particular chart shows you that uh, Japan has already crossed that inflection point. Uh, you, you can see the dotted line is their growth rate, and it's gone below zero. They actually have a shrinking population. And that's also a, a problem in some places. By the way, I live in Maine. Maine is one of two states in the United States that has a shrinking population. <laughs> so I'm aware of that as well. Now we're going to take a look at some economic theory. Uh, this is the original sort of seminal growth model from back in the 1950s. It's called Solo and Swan, named after the two economists that sort of put this out. And this is a very simple uh, simulation that takes the Solo Swan model and just goes forward in time and uh, has some basic uh, parameter uh, settings that sort of more or less mirror what we expect in our economy. And as you can see, uh, we have exponential growth. And the uh, blue line is just the output uh, per capita, and the red line is consumption per capita, predicted by this uh, relatively simple model. Um, and we can see that consumption per capita, and remember, that's per person. That's not aggregate. So that means, in this particular model, consumption per capita is some 50 times greater than it was at the start of the uh, process. And what does that mean? Um, 50 times more stuff? That's an interesting question. What if we took that exact same model and we set technological growth and population growth to zero? Well, what happens then as we let the simulation proceed is that growth flattens. And you can see that it flattens out at some consumption per capita some 500 times greater than it is, well, let's say today was the beginning of that change. Um, once again, uh, I think that's a little hard to sort of wrap your head around, what does consumption per person 500 times greater than now in real dollar terms mean? Um, I'm not sure. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> but the bottom right chart shows the real problem. Um, as growth goes to zero, uh, return on investment goes to zero. It turns out that long-term return on investment in capitalism is dependent upon growth. Uh, if you don't have growth, there's this sort of basic uh, motivation for capitalism evaporates, and it goes to zero in this particular case. Uh, and actually, it goes to the depreciation rate, which is very close to zero. So um, some of the more modern economic growth models save the day uh, with uh, what is called endogenous growth theory. And that is uh, the uh, system grows because of innovation. And in this particular chart, we're looking at the uh, sort of a proxy for innovation. Innovation, It's the stock of trade market, trademarks uh, in the United States. And you can see the uh, dark line, which is sort of uh, projected forward with the dotted line, is the stock. And it's increasing exponentially. Uh, so in, a, in essence, what this is saying is that we need an exponentially increasing array of goods to support the growth of the general economy. Uh, along with, you know, population growth is nice, but we really depend on technological improvement to really take the income per capita up or the consumption per capita up to have a positive growth rate there. So in this particular uh, uh, economic model, we see that it requires, once again, in order to have continuous growth, we have to have more and more and more stuff trademarked. Um, so will endogenous growth models save the day? 
Well, here's a little uh, short break, Arthur C. Clarke's Third Law of Technology. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And uh, I'm wondering if, in fact, our hopes that we'll, we'll innovate our way into a continually growing future are perhaps depending upon magic. So perhaps instead of more stuff, we can have just better stuff, or both. That is to say, we improve the quality of goods uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the quality of output. Our productivity increases through research and development. Well, this chart actually shows R&D output of all industries in the United States uh, through 2007, and a fit in line, which shows that, once again, uh, we have a takeoff, and it's moving upward rather quickly. Interestingly, you'll notice that the line is relatively flat up until about 1996 or 1987. And the next two chart, uh, uh, the next charts are going to show uh, that there is a, a break point uh, at around 1996 or 97. Uh, this is uh, actually we're finally getting to see an at-risk product uh, put to use here, and, and there's more later, so hang on. But the uh, and, and by the way, this was uh, this break point was proven using some econometric techniques. But the chart on the left um, is a distribution of uh, ratio of R&D investment to output across a bunch of sectors. I think it was 17 sectors, if I remember correctly. Uh, and you can see that the uh, mean on that uh, it's a fairly normal distribution, and the mean on that distribution is less than one. That means for each unit of R&D invested, you get more than, you get a bigger return. So the ratio of R&D to, uh, to output is greater than one. You get a good bang for your buck in terms of your investment in R&D. However, from 1997 uh, through 2004, which is the most recent data I had last year, I actually think I could redo this with this year's data, there's one more year of data now, um, we have different relationship. And here we see that the mean in this particular uh, uh, distribution of R&D output is 1.6, and that means that we're putting 1.6 units of R&D to get one unit of growth. Getting more, we're getting, this is not in the models. You can see in the title up at the top, not in the models. The endogenous, endogenous growth theory models essentially assume uh, a linear relationship between input for R&D and uh, results in terms of growth. So that shows that that's a problem. So here's my thesis again, mainstream growth theory is in denial. In this very brief overview, and by the way, I have a manuscript that's about 300 pages long that, uh, that I'm working on now that has a lot of detail on, on proving a lot of this and a lot more detail on the economic models. Uh, but we have such a short time, I went through it very quickly. Essentially, um, what I'm saying is that the uh, uh, assumptions that are necessary to make these models mathematical, mathematically stable often have nothing to do with reality. Uh, they fly in the face of recent data in some parts. So um, what I thought I would do is try to create a model that doesn't even depend on, on um, well, first of all, it's, it's nonlinear. And it does not depend on any of these uh, convenient uh, stability assumptions to make the uh, system uh, stable. Uh, for those of you who uh, understand uh, uh, um, nonlinear systems and, uh, and differential equations, you know that uh, you can have saddle path stability. And frequently, that's an assumption in many of the growth models. And you know what happens when you get off the saddle path, your uh, trajectory shoots away from the saddle path and never comes back, typically. Um, well, we make assumptions to keep us on the saddle path. Okay. So um, oh, another little quote here. This is Yogi Berra. Uh, tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Now I've heard that maybe it was actually Niels Bohr that said that, but we don't know. So can we keep doing what we're doing and keep getting what we got? Uh, well, here's, the, uh, here's a bit of story about saddle path. Um, a lot of times we get really uncomfortable when we have our mainstream models uh, sort of shoot us into infinity or crash us down to zero or, or 
some something else. And we frequently figure out ways to assume things that make a stable outcome. Well, in the, in the simulation that follows, there's no end exogenous inputs at all. In fact, it's totally decoupled, in some sense, in the assumptions of mainstream growth, mainstream growth theory. You'll see that the model itself is built around the 20th century. It's, an it's based on the historical uh, macroeconomic variables that we're going to model. So embedded within the uh, system that I developed is, in fact, mainstream economic theory. But it makes no assumptions in terms of production functions or, or, uh, or um, utility maximization or any of the other things, uh, components that are typically a part of growth theory. So once we've built a simulation that does a decent job of modeling the 20th century, actually it's 107 years, from 1900 to 2007, then let's turn the model loose and see where it goes in the future. In other words, if we've figured out a way to create an endogenous self-generating model of the 20th century that does a good job of modeling that the history of growth, and presumably what we did for the last 107 years, if we keep doing it and we go forward, we're going to see where we go. So <clears throat> this is a wordy slide, and I apologize, but I'll try to explain it very carefully. Um, the key to the simulation is, in fact, understanding energy. Uh, typically, a production function is labor, capital, and productivity. Uh, well, in this particular case, we're going to have labor and we're going to have capital uh, as components because those are measurable uh, components. There's data on those from the 20th century. But tech, uh, always, typically in these models, the sort of technology parameter is sort of a, a residual. That is, you know, you've got you put in labor, capital, and then you have the actual history, and how do you, and the rest is explained by some residual parameter uh, called technological growth. Um, well, what I've got is I got a data set of actual energy consumption in the United States uh, for 106 years, very detailed data set that includes everything from coal to hydro, you name it. And the relationship of that to actual useful work that's been produced in the United States. So the chart that's in the middle that's kind of overlaid a little bit shows you the uh, efficiency of energy conversion to work. In 1900, less than 5% of the energy input into our system actually came out as useful services, energy services. Uh, by the end of the, uh, of the history of the system there, you can see that uh, it's close to 25%. We've gotten much better at converting raw energy into useful work. The, oops, what is that? Out of the way. See where that came from. Overlaying my thing, I can't seem to get rid of it. It's all now, maybe it'll go away. Huh. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry it's overlaying whatever that is. Maybe it'll go away in the next slide. Oh, it did. Um, the uh, energy intensity of output is, in fact, uh, showing you uh, that if we normalize to one in 1900, it shows you that we've gotten much, much better. At, uh, at creating output from less and less energy. All right. Oh, shoot. Who knows what's going on here? OK, here's a schematic of the uh, general model. And by the way, this doesn't show a lot of the detail. Uh, you can see that we have physical capital right up here. We have information and communication technology capital, which turns out to be an important parameter to throw into the model in the last half of the century. We have labor, and we have work from energy. And these factors go into gross domestic product. Gross domestic product, there's feedback loops all over the place, but one of the primary ones is one that goes into capital accumulation and, and, uh, and, uh, and the amount of physical capital we generate. Okay, This is just one. This is a schematic of the sort of energy module in the model. Uh, and you can see it gets pretty complex, and there are a lot of feedback loops. Uh, for example, up in the upper left corner, corner, we have the gross domestic product feeding in to primary energy demand, and we have a lot of other stuff going on. And I'm not going to go through this very, very carefully because it's, it's, it's not going to make any sense. But uh, this, this begins to give you uh, a sense of how complex the model is. 
Now this is some pictures from the calibrated model. Uh, and notice I say uh, mean absolute percentage errors are very small. Uh, the upper left chart shows you uh, capital. Uh, the uh, model, um, the simulation is the blue line. The actual data is the red line. So calibration is the blue line. And you can see that from 1900 to 2007, or actually 2008, um, uh, we have a pretty good, the model does a pretty good job of following capital formation in the United States. Uh, labor, uh, on the chart in the bottom right corner, you can see that the uh, model itself, the blue line, does not capture the Great Depression very well. Uh, but otherwise, and by the way, interestingly enough, um, labor uh, comes back to the predicted level pretty quickly after the Great Depression. Uh, it also doesn't capture the overshoot from the World War II in the early in the mid 1940s, and it doesn't capture obviously other uh, disruptions. But by and large, overall, the trend is good. Uh, this is a uh, schematic of the of some of the energy module, but the charts on the right are actually interesting. I remember I talked about the um, primary inten energy intensity of output getting so much better over time. The calibrated uh, model output is the blue line in the upper right chart, and the actual values are in the red line. And efficiency of primary energy conversion um, is in the bottom right, and you can see the model does a pretty good job also. It's the blue line of following along the actual values. Uh, interestingly, this is um, the energy services intensity output is the larger chart to the right, and it sort of has an inflection point, which I think I found that interesting uh, when I was doing uh, looking into the details of this model. Um, and essentially, what happens is, if you read the uh, second paragraph, uh, primary intensity has fallen steadily um, as more efficient manufacturing processes and prime movers were invented. So we got better and better at using energy. And that led to sort of industrialization in the United States, which created, caused the overall um, energy side of output to increase. Uh, but then, since the mid-1970s, the U.S. has been shifting from manufacturing to service. So even though we're getting better at using energy, we're using less of it to create our output. So we've actually uh, hit an inflection point in terms of our energy services intensity of output. I thought that was interesting. This is uh, gross domestic mo product from the calibrated model. Uh, does a pretty good job. Uh, didn't catch the Great Depression. Uh, didn't catch uh, the uh, it surge from World War II. Uh, also, uh, um, uh, but otherwise, did a pretty good job. And, and by the way, the bottom right chart uh, is the monetary value of output in actual real dollars, 1992 dollars, uh, rather than just a, uh, a sort of normalized uh, starting at one in 1900 and going forward. Um, that's the monetary value. By the way, you'll notice uh, from the upper left chart that we're, the economy is almost 30 times larger than it was in 1900. Okay, now let's see where we go in the future. This is, this is what's interesting. Uh, a couple of things here. Um, the upper left chart takes us up to about 2050, and you can see the line gets steeper and steeper. That is the exponential growth curve that well, we all expect. <laughs> it's just when you see it and you start thinking about it, it gets to be a little strange. For example, uh, the index goes from 27.36 in 2007 to 105.62 in 2050, four times larger. So uh, our GDP rose about 27 times in 107 years, and now we expect it to go four times larger than that in the next 40 years. The bottom right chart, which, by the way, uses some um, at-risk uh, Monte Carlo stuff to create the uh, distributions you see in the bottom right of that chart, labor intensity of output. We haven't seen this one yet. What you're seeing is <clears throat> the red line, by the way, is the actual values. It's the, um, the amount of labor necessary to create output in the United States. Well, obviously, we've gotten much better at creating output with less and less labor, and you see that in the chart. The model going forward to 2050 uh, shows the potential to actually go to zero almost. And uh, as I have in the big uh, uh, note to the left there, this is a problem for unskilled 
and actually somewhat for skilled as well, but really for unskilled. Uh, unskilled labor is becoming less and less necessary to create output according to this model. If, if the past has anything to do with the future, or in fact, if we keep doing what we've been doing. Okay, so another wordy slide, and I apologize. Uh, several impossible outcomes, uh, and that is um, we end up with nearly infinite GDP, and that comes about, I think it's about 2080. There it is, yep. It's, it, 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 the second paragraph says if we do that in 2080, very strange things happen. Uh, the growth rate, given that labor function we saw a minute ago, uh, the labor intensity of output goes to almost nothing. And the exponential growth of normalized output goes to 2,487, uh, which is huge. Consumption per labor hour goes from 7.5 in 2007 to 289.39. What does that mean exactly? Uh, the amount of consumption per hour worked, which we know has increased, uh, and that's why we're all more comfortable than we were in 1900. Uh, is now going to increase 38 more times than where it is today. Uh, that is something that's difficult to wrap your head around. Well, unfortunately, my model explodes in 2080, or 2081 approximately. Um, and this is, uh, we can't get past that without some tweaking, and I'll do that, I'll show you how that's done in just a minute. Uh, but, um, Primary energy demand increases quite dramatically. And remember, I'm abstracting away here any reason to think that we are going to run out of sources of energy. So we'll figure out a way to, to find this power and also to deal with the pollution. Uh, but the uh, data, real data is the red line. The simulated data is the blue line. And you can see as that sort of exponential growth curve kicks in, and there's a couple of things happening, uh, some of the marginal changes are some of the inputs are so small that very small changes create large effects, and you know the butterfly effect type stuff. Essentially, what we have here is a complex system that's running up against a chaotic outcome. And by the way, I don't have time in this presentation, but I, I have a section in, uh, of research that I've done uh, using chaos theory that uh, wraps up pretty nicely with all this and, and shows some pretty interesting uh, outcomes. But, of course, the usual limits to growth theory would also uh, put a limit on energy production. But here, we're not going to have any limits. But, but one thing that's interesting at the bottom of that sort of second paragraph is that when you have an ex expectation, when you're heading towards those infinite numbers, you have infinite efficiency in converting power to work, which means no waste. Right? So if we have a 25% efficiency in converting power to work, that means we have 75% waste, typical power plant. What, 30% efficient, really good ones, or maybe 40 or 50? Uh, combined heat and power might do better than that, but nobody has zero waste, uh, that, at least not yet. So in order for this, for us to have a replication of what we've had the last 107 years, uh, we have to start to suspend reality to believe that's going to happen. Uh, here's some uh, outcomes. Uh, in which I actually allowed the uh, used the Palisade products to uh, to put inputs into the uh, simulation as it ran. Uh, in this particular case, um, suppose we have a slowing in technological improvement. In other words, we realize that the bang for our buck from R and D growth and, and there's sort of limits to the number of different products we can produce, the constant innovation. But we allow population growth to continue at recent trends. Um, so uh, what happens here is <laughs> we see that the, uh, and you can see once again, I've superimposed the actual GDP over uh, the simulation. The simulation peaks at around 2030, and then we have this rapid decline. And in fact, by the end of the simulation in 2100, we're about where we were in 1960, or maybe 1970, in terms of uh, gross domestic product. Uh, hard to imagine that kind of catastrophic change coming forward. The interesting thing is if we do that, and we can remember I said we still have population growth, uh, which is probably unlikely, but if we do, output per labor hour goes down, and you'll notice that the uh, at-risk simulation actually goes below zero. Well, that's not possible. Uh, well, maybe it is. Maybe machines will do everything. Uh, but 
that's not a good that's not a good sign for humans. <laughs> but the uh, the outcome is not is pretty dire. It is a big problem. So the question then is, uh, is there a way forward? Uh, can we actually uh, find a solution to this problem? Uh, in other words, if we keep doing what we did, we're going to are we going to get what we got? The answer is no. So how can we? change this. Well, we can't keep doing what we did, obviously. So I just arbitrarily created an objective function and charted out an ideal GDP path. I said, suppose we uh, look at a path that takes us to zero growth around the year 2200, uh, which is still uh, quite a bit larger than where we are today in terms of uh, gross domestic product. And these are all normalized per person, by the way. <coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the parameters in the production function um, and other relationships in the model are, uh, are empirically determined from the data, right, over the past 107 years. So it's just it's a data-driven model. It's not a theoretically driven model. Um, but embedded in the beta, data clearly are patterns that built the 20th century. So what drives our capitalist system uh, is what driving, is driving this model. So it has some axiomatic, axiomatic assumptions built into the parameters inside the simulation. What I did is I, I ran constrained op optimization on the production function parameters, and it only worked up until around 2050 or so, maybe 2060. And those two charts at the bottom show you that the model basically falls off the saddle path uh, and really gets very sensitive to small parameter changes. So I'm able to follow along this ideal path. Uh, and by the way, before the inflection point in that growth path, it's more or less what we've been doing. Uh, but uh, the, the model either explodes up or explodes down, both bad outcomes. Um, so once again, uh, I, I just want to reiterate, it's, we are uh, playing saddle path games here, which are, in fact, uh, sort of the standard techniques for uh, for um, solving these uh, these systems, these dynamical systems. And the problem is that uh, some things in the economy are not going to let us stay on that saddle path. So uh, in my uh, language here, it's like the knife edge is getting thinner and thinner until there's no edge at all, and then you just got to fall off. Okay. So can new relationships be imposed on the model that lead to reasonable outcomes? Uh, well, instead of just doing constrained optimization on the production function, by the way, I think I forgot to show you the production function. I went right past that. There was a slide that had a, a link uh, to a couple of pages of, uh, of mathematics, and, and I'll get back to that after I'm finished here. Um, but. Uh, what else can we do? Well, there's the savings and depreciation parameters, the growth and decay rates of labor supply, and parameters that control innovation growth. These parameters were all empirically determined from the 20th century, essentially. Uh, and can we fiddle with those parameters and get us further down? Well, in fact, we can. Uh, in this case, we get a little past 2100. Uh, so the interesting thing is, in order to, to sort of ride on this ideal path, for 45 years further than we did a minute ago, uh, the aggregate uh, stock of labor and capital has to stabilize, which means essentially it has to sum zero. One can grow, but the other can fall. So if we have, a, if we continue to grow the stock of labor, then the stock of capital has to fall. Or if we continue to grow the stock of capital, stock of labor has to fall. Um, both of those are not necessarily comforting ways to be. And of course, and, and meanwhile, by the way, innovation continues unabated. And that's what keeps the growth on the economy. So <laughs> we didn't make it on that one. So is there really a way forward? Well, here's where the really the key change has to come in. Uh, what really throws the economy off in, in that last model, in fact, in, in some of the others, is increasing sensitivity to very small changes in continued growth. Uh, of the ability to get useful work out of energy. Uh, in this particular, uh, and this is once again using at risk, uh, we see that going forward um, from uh, now, uh, you can see the actual uh, energy intensity of output 
versus simulated. And then going forward, uh, we see that once again, the simulation says we can go below zero. Well, you know that's not possible. Just impossible, in fact. What happens is, in the actual model, the, the expected value line that's down the middle there converges to zero. And when it gets very close to zero, in fact, when it gets as low as it's getting here, uh, it creates extreme sensitivities in the rest of the dynamic model to small changes in energy intensity. And, it, and, and the feedback loops uh, cause the model to eventually crash. Uh, but um, if we go below zero, that's actually impossible. That's not mathematically or even socially or economically possible, or physically possible, using physics. So is there a solution? Um, well, it's actually the upper left chart shows the expected path of energy intensity of output and it converges to zero. The key, and you'll see the little left arrow, uh, is that it has to be asymptotic to a value that leads a stable GDP. So in the simulation, I just arbitrarily picked a value that actually works, so that where the uh, system doesn't collapse, and said, let's run the, run the simulation now, but not allow primary energy intensity of output to go below the value beyond which the system collapses. Or, or actually explodes is a better way to put it. Uh, and you can see the uh, two charts. Uh, so if, if output per labor unit of labor stabilizes at a level around double today, and by the way, in the bot very bottom left is the original chart that I showed you, showing that the output per labor goes could go below zero, very bad. Well, if I can stabilize energy intensity, that means we still need labor going forward. And you can see that the output per unit of labor stabilizes around 15. Actually, if you go forward with that beyond 2200, that, that line oscillates and eventually uh, converges on, on 15. And that was something I just arbitrarily set into the simulation. And that also allows GDP, the bottom left chart, to stabilize at around 100. And um, you can see that as well in terms of the uh, 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 my, my ideal future line is the uh, red line and the, ideal, and the uh, simulated path by fiddling with the model is the blue line. So there is a way forward, but it's zero growth is the outcome. So uh, can we keep doing what we're doing and get what we got? Well, the model says no. So what I've done basically is show that in, in the last, uh, I'm not sure how long I've talked because I don't have a clock in front of me, but hopefully it's around 45 minutes. I've shown that the foundations upon which the last century's growth were based upon cannot work for another century. So we have to think about what's going to happen, and, we ha and, and I think it's very important. And, uh, but, you know, when I started this research, I thought for sure that the ecological constraints would, would slam us first. That is, we'll have real problems with energy and, and, uh, and, energy and, and waste sinks. But in fact, um, this economic instability and insustainability, which I don't even think is a real word, may be closer than we think. Um, and I'll skip right to the, uh, uh, the bottom, although the, the bold more is not going to be better for long. You know, we've all bought, thought that more and more stuff is better, growth and everything. Uh, it's not going to be better for long. Uh, so this is not only an overhaul of how we do business, but also a shift of what living and working is all about. So the last couple of slides, it's very hard to imagine such a future, but we have to if we are to see a future in which there are semblance of the comforts we have defined as good and necessary. And the last slide just has a few uh, uh, quotes that I find quite entertaining. I'm sure some of you have seen these before. Uh, Heavier than flying air machines are impossible. That was in 1895. <laughs> Uh, there's no likelihood that man can ever tap the power of the atom. That's actually a Nobel Prize winner in 1923. Uh, this is interesting, and I believe this quote is from the 1970s. Uh, this is the uh, university, Yale University management professor who gave Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, a C. Uh, the paper was about a reliable overnight delivery service, and he says, the concept is interesting and well-formed, in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. And finally, everything that can be invented has been invented. That was in 1899. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, 
I guess uh, we'll take some questions if I can, if there's a way to do that. I think I have to. Oh, sure. What? Uh, every, everybody can just. Show you guys type. just a couple of pages. You can still see my desktop, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, just a couple. Bill, of, that was great. This this page is a brief description of the production function. I'm not going to get into it in great detail, uh, but you can see there's there's a bit of math behind this. Um, and the final production function is at the bottom of the page. It's called 3.6. It's, it's labeled 3.6 in this particular slide. And that's actually the foundation of the model itself. Okay. And it's quite a simple equation, actually, although it's not simple to drive. So. Well, that, that was, uh, some of that was pretty darn scary. <laughs> Does uh, anybody have any questions? You can just type them in your chat, and I'll read them off. And yeah, I so. Oh, I have to turn over my desktop, right? Is that how I do it? Oh, uh, I, I can take that or... Okay. Yeah, I'll just, I'll take that and put up my slide here. There we go. See, here we are. Anybody have anything? Well, now what... We've seen robots taking care of a lot of labor, certainly in manufacturing so far. How... Uh, how does that figure into anything? We can we start thinking, you know, I'm a big fan of science fiction, so I, when I was a kid, I thought that's, that's going to be great. Robots are going to do all the work, and we can just relax. And But now I can see that uh, there's all kinds of trouble with that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite possible that we might get there, uh, but I believe that that actually leads to a stable growth environment uh, because at some point um, uh, we're no longer, uh, you know, engaging in, uh, in capitalism if we're all living lives of leisure, uh, and um, there can only be so many of us. So that's that's a zero growth outcome once again, it, and it's just, you know, the foundations of sort of capital accumulation are that you're going to get a return on your investment. Mm -hmm. You're going to invest, and down the road, you're going to have a lot more left over. Uh, and the uh, the problem there is that requires continuous growth. And what I've just demonstrated is is that can't you can't keep doing that. No. Oh. I, I think we've all suspected that. And it's really interesting to see see it laid out like that. Well, I, I have a, I'm reading questions in the sidebar there. I see Albert Chin says. Uh, did I encounter serial correlation? So how do you compensate for this? Actually, this this is not an econometric uh, model. Uh, there's, it, it's it's really a, a, a system of um, differential equations that are all tied in through various uh, feedback loops, and serial correlation is actually probably there. Um, but I, I wasn't trying to solve an econometric system. I was trying to create a dynamic model that basically mimicked the past. And then once I, it, it took a lot of work uh, to sort of get that to work. And then once that worked, I said, okay, let's turn it loose and see where we go in the future. Uh, I don't think, I don't have any idea if the Fed knows about this, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about uh, leaps in, in uh, this is kind of paraphrasing the question here. What, what, how did, what happens if uh, energy? Okay, let's. Uh, you know, I'm a science fiction fan. What? How? How does something like uh, nuclear fusion and uh, theor theoretically unlimited power play into some of this? Right. Well, as I said in the presentation, uh, that would actually be good for the model because the model assumes that all the energy we need is going to be provided. And right. I'm not, I'm not all that sure that. That assumption is is actually a good one. Uh, I'm I'm uh, one of those people that thinks we may have already peaked on oil production, uh -huh. and I'm not a uh, I'm not a uh, I'm not comforted by the uh, oil shale the gas uh, shales uh, production stuff. Uh, I've worked a lot with a guy named Matt Simmons, who's uh, very well known in the oil and gas industry, who has data that shows that these uh, gas shale uh, discoveries or, or extraction things. Uh, peak very quickly. Uh, you get you get good flow rates for a year or two, and then the flow rapidly falls to about 5% for the next 30 years. 
So there's a lot of gas there, but the flow rate is the problem. You know, you got to get it out to keep up with demand. So we'll see going forward. Uh, and uh, infusion would be great because that would actually uh, move us into a, a new age in terms of energy. Mm -hmm. That doesn't do anything to the assumptions necessary for economic growth and, and return on investment and all that. That's that's still a exponential growth problem that I don't think we've actually grabbed wrapped our heads around. No. <laughs> uh, oh, would uh, do you have any? spreadsheet models that you're willing to share? Uh, actually, this, this, none of this is built in a spreadsheet, so no. Uh, okay. It's a, it's, it's a, the model was run on a, on a software called Vensim, and the uh, uh, input parameters, uh, what happens is it's a simulation, and what I would do is, is uh, actually allow the, where I used at risk, I would allow the uh, input parameters to vary based on some probability distributions that we put together. And that's how I got those outputs that used at risk. But um, the, that was through a spreadsheet, but the model itself has, is not spreadsheet related. Mm -hmm. But and I, the I would power be happy to share the, the PowerPoint. Um, I, I'd be happy to do that. I think sure. uh, it may already be on your site because yes. I presented something very similar to this at the user conference in, in New Jersey. I think it was in November or October I'll last year. I'll send people, I'll direct them right to that. Okay. Well, how about chaotic events? Uh, we have an attendee who is wondering more about predicting chaotic events than like the the the, yeah. ori the original stock market crash. And what I'd suggest is um, that uh, yeah, I actually there's a lot of work I've done on that, and um, there is a, a real propensity for the system to become chaotic uh, when it gets near the point of explosion in the mathematics, uh, the, the, what happens is you get these, particularly if I model it a little bit differently, and I have done that, uh, towards the end, the last, sort of like, <laughs> sort of like the Big Bang, you know, you focus in on the first few seconds and there's very interesting stuff going on, and then after 10 seconds it's just like, it uh, gets boring. Uh, <laughs> but uh, here it's the last few iterations of the model uh, you get these crazy wild swings and fluctuations that make no sense. They look completely random, but they're determ there's nothing random in the model that's driving that. It's a, it's a deterministic model in that sense, and yet you get these seemingly random outcomes. And then, uh, and, they're they, they're, and they're, they appear unpredictable as well. Uh, and that's a chaotic uh, result. And, and I've actually modeled the, the, the uh, future a little bit differently uh, in ways that, um, relate to my manuscript, and it's nothing in the paper, in the presentation I just did that, that show that, uh, that uh, definitely have chaotic outcomes. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's very interesting, the, the, because the, the change from something completely predictable to something seemingly random happens very quickly, as, you, as anybody that studies mm -hmm. chaos knows. So it's not like you can say, well, if we add a little more uh, of this innovation, We'll get a little more output. Uh, what happens is you get this crazy collapse of a system that is not predictable, and that is, I believe, a potential for us as well. Uh, you know, we're probably all going to be dead before we get there because uh, <laughs> my model, right. anyway, says around 2080. Uh, <laughs> not to say that I'm exactly right, but the comfort of that. <laughs> uh, we have a few years where things are relatively stable and continuous growth will continue to work. But you know, if you just plot any exponential curve. Uh, it gets steep very fast, and as it gets steep, the uh, marginal changes become huge. Small changes in one thing create huge, cha huge changes in everything else, and the sensitivities get to the point where there's a real potential for chaotic outcomes. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, we have one, this is very interesting. How would you use your conclusions to alter the residual perpetuity va value formula used in stock company valuations. Often, conservative <laughs> growth rates are used, for example, 0.5. That's, that's a, a very interesting question, isn't it? And, and I think that, um, that that's a great question because it kind of goes right to the heart of, of, uh, of sort of the, we're all uh, embedded in this system so deeply that a perpetuity model makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, this sort of growth forever idea uh, is, 
perfectly normal in finance. Uh, and I, I don't have an answer to that specific question in the sense that what would I do to that to the uh, to a perpetuity uh, calculation? But um, it, it doesn't. <laughs> when you start talking about return on investment going towards zero. Um, you just have to figure that, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have some return now, and there's growth going forward. But the idea of continuous growth, or you know, long-term continuous growth of two and a half percent a year, uh, forever, uh, makes no sense. It really doesn't make any sense. Uh, and and that's something nobody really wants to sort of deal with because you really have to change your way of thinking fundamentally. And this kind of goes back to the slide I had about the growth imperative being kind of an addiction uh, and creating a sense of a sort of a denial, if you will. Uh, I, I do that, too, because I, I do some work in finance. And, and uh, you know, I just run along with the same old assumptions and, and come up with those conclusions. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, well, you know, it's, work, it's going to work for a while, but we better start changing our way of thinking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I uh, agreed. <laughs> Question: How does globalization affect the model? Well, that's that's also a very good question because this model is is, is built around U.S. data. It's totally the United States, um, and uh, uh, I agree that uh, that that is that is a flaw. And, and so um, uh, there is. Uh, and, and by the way, in, in my manuscript, in the, in the more detailed research, I do have a lot of information on on the global economy and on the um, expectations for growth in the, in the rest of the world. But uh, in order to build this simulation, I needed really detailed data on, on a lot of macroeconomic variables, and particularly the energy uh, stuff. And that data just doesn't exist uh, outside of the United States in that kind of detail. So uh, probably if we include the rest of the world, um, uh, it might buy some time, assuming that uh, that the rest of the world remains stable. Uh, and by the way, I have a couple chapters in my manuscript on, uh, particularly in the stuff on chaos, on what it means for the world to remain stable. Uh, and I talk about income distributions and some of the, uh, if you take some of the basic growth models and uh, extract, them, extract them into uh, using, sort of break the world into two parts, uh, the, the rich and the poor, it turns out that to maintain a return on investment uh, there's a strong motivation for the rich side of the world to accumulate more than the poor side of the world. And, I, I, and without getting into a lot of detail, uh, I've, I've sort of shown that to be true, uh, which means that uh, there's not a real motivation from the uh, sort of people who are getting the return on investment to see, this, see the wealth spread. The only way to protect that relationship is with stronger and stronger um, police uh, labor, guard labor, which is military, police, uh, all that sort of stuff, bigger walls, bigger fences, and uh, that actually leads to issues as well. But that's a whole other subject. <laughs> well, what's the, what, what's the working title of your book? Uh, uh, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> so it question. sounds like it's, is this, geez, a, this this, uh, I think well, the, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, hang on a second here. I think I've got a, uh, oops, that's not Because I, I think we all want to read it. Uh, final manuscript, let's see. Uh, uh, the Fallacy of Endless Growth right now. Oh, I like it. The, uh, is the working title. Oh, this this is good. you got, yeah. So how close is it to being done? Because that's. Well, I've, I've actually, uh, I've run it by uh, an editor. And he handed it back to me and said it's far too mathematical and uh, <laughs> academic for anybody to really want to read. And oh, that's what they said to Stephen Hawking, right? They said you can't have any formula at all in your in your book except for you can have the, the Einstein's formula. And that's it. Well, that's kind of the response I got. And, and, and that, <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> well, it is, a, there is some truth to what they said. Uh, so I'm actually working on a rewrite and, and – uh, my goal is to have that rewrite done by midsummer, and and that's it's a lot of work because the, the story is kind of told with the mathematics, mm -hmm. a lot of it, so I've got to convert that to words that are uh, pretty digestible, and uh, and I'm in the process of doing that. So uh, hopefully by midsummer I'll I'll have the revision uh, ready, and who knows maybe in the fall I'll, I'll get it published. We'll see. 
oh, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, and I think it's quite timely because uh, a lot of the um, sort of craziness we're seeing in, in the world economies are, in fact, um, similar to some of the predictions in, in the book. So. Well, I think our attendees should go to your website, too, because you have some information on there and some uh, really cool energy, uh, U.S. energy um, interactive. A little bit, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty busy in the, uh, in, up here in, in, in promoting and working with uh, alternative energies, and particularly uh, fuels derived from wood, because Maine has a lot of wood. And uh, so I've done a lot of work on, on that, and, and I'm actually the chief economist on a couple of uh, uh, groups, one in Washington called the Biomass Thermal Energy Council. Uh, and uh, I'm actually just finishing up a study on uh, converting uh, schools in, in the Northeast to using uh, wood fuel, wood chip fuel. Uh, and that's just, that's futuremetrics.com, so you'll be able to find that. Futuremetrics.com. And actually, you can get my email from there, too. If you want to write me an email independently and have a conversation or you need, you'd like a little more information, I'd be happy to share. Sure, and if and if uh, and if you're watching this webcast in the future and you still have some questions, you can just uh, email me. That's j r o m e o h a l l at palisade.com, or you could go to Bill's website and track him down. That, and I'm also going to email uh, a link to this recording and some other information to everybody who's with us now. And do we have? Uh, I think we're out of time. We are. It's yeah. Way. Timing went very well. Yeah, uh, this, I, thank, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Jameson, I want to thank you and Palisade also for providing this forum, and, and uh, I've enjoyed this, and I hope the listeners have too. So. I think they have. And well, goodbye, thanks. everybody. Have a great day. Yes, thank you, everybody.